Hi there, this week I'm in, um, I actually can't remember. Well, I'm somewhere in Canada, and the only place in Canada that rains this much is Vancouver. And for once, where I am actually does have something to do with the video, for you see, a few weeks ago, the girlfriend and I were coming back to Canada from China, so we found ourselves in the premium economy cabin of an Air Canada 787-9. So this video will be predominantly a recollection of that experience. I'll also throw in footage from a few other flights in the same cabin and I'll give you a rundown of what it's like to fly both domestic and international on Air Canada's premium economy product. Our route today has us departing east out of Shanghai over the Japanese island of Kyushu and up north along the Pacific's rim. Traversing the northern Pacific will pass just south of the Aleutian Islands and then begin our approach into North America over Vancouver Island and into Vancouver, crossing the Pacific in about 12 hours for a total distance of 5,610 miles. Alright, let's go back to the beginning. Shanghai is a monster of a city, complete with a metro system that is a nightmare to animate, but I did it anyways. The city is serviced by two major airports, Hongqiao and Pudong. Hongqiao serves mostly domestic flights, while the international hub is Pudong, where we will be departing out of today. Taxis are fairly expensive here, so it's much cheaper to take the public transit if you're commuting to or from the airports. But if you haven't done before, I would highly recommend taking the Shanghai Transrapid. It is currently the only operational maglev in the world and cuts the 25 to 30 minute transit time via metro down to 7 to 8 minutes, a truly mind boggling number. During peak hours, these trains can reach a top speed of 430 kilometers an hour, or for those of you who speak American, that's 270 miles an hour. These trains are very comfortable and an experience in itself. You're literally flying along, hovering an inch over gigantic electromagnets, and the best part is that the tracks run alongside the airport highway so you can watch the cars and buses receding into the distance as you overtake them. Truly an experience not to be missed if you're at all a transportation enthusiast who happens to be in Shanghai. However which way you get to the airport, you'll find that PVG is split into two terminals, T1 and T2. Both are linked via another pair of trains to the newly built satellite terminals, S1 and S2, which are themselves larger than the original two. All four buildings carry domestic and international flights, with the majority of upper floors serving as international departures and the lower floors for domestic ones. Air Canada operates out of Terminal 2, so that's where we'll be headed today. The Terminal 2 building is essentially one really long concourse, which makes it dead easy to navigate. The architecture lets in tons of natural light and there's plenty of comfortable seating options and charging outlets. For those of you with long transits, there are sleeping pods available, and also these arguably anachronistic internet terminals. But for us aviation enthusiasts, the highlight would have to be the glass curtain walls which run the length of the terminal. They provide stunning views of the planes on the aprons, as well as the two runways. Shanghai is also a great place to spot A380s, as almost every airline with a super jumbo in its fleet operates at least one to Pudong. Now, normally passengers traveling in Air Canada's premium economy do not get lounge access, but I have Star Alliance Gold status, which grants me and one person with whom I'm traveling access to Star Alliance Gold lounges. In this case, it was the Air China Business Class Lounge, which also allows paper entry depending on capacity, a nominal fee of 400 renminbi or about 60 US dollars. This lounge is quite big as it serves a few dozen daily flights. There were two floors with the lower floor mostly for seating areas and a staff bar in the back. There was also a luggage storage room, and spread throughout the space were these Wi-Fi terminals which validated a connection to the unrestricted high-speed internet as opposed to the public Wi-Fi otherwise available in the terminals. The upstairs area was even larger, with many more seating options. Overall, the seating spaces felt cozy, being tucked into corners and nooks, giving the impression of a smaller space than it actually is. In addition, there were literature stands dotted throughout the space, as well as beverage stations such as this one. In addition, there was a business center and another room for you to store your luggage in. And in the middle of the second floor was the buffet area. Most of the hot food options available were of the Chinese variety, but sadly there were no minced pork and chive dumplings, which are a staple of Air China lounges, and possibly the best known dumplings to man. Kinda disappointed with the lack of dumplings, I didn't end up getting anything to eat. Instead, I booked a shower room and brought my camera in with me. Now these suites aren't particularly fancy or spacious, but they were very clean and the water pressure was good. And for those of you who have watched my videos before, you'll know that, to me, any lounge with a working shower is a good lounge. 
For a detailed tour of this lounge, I've made a separate video, links in the description. But for now, let's head to the gate and check out the aircraft that we'll be taking. This is an Air Canada Boeing 777 headed to Toronto. So it's not our right for today, I just thought I'd show you this plane because I thought it looked cool. Now this is an Air Canada 787-9, the exact type of plane that we'll be taking to Vancouver, but this particular one isn't going to Vancouver, this one's going to Montreal and I thought I'd show you again because I thought it looked cool again. And now that I'm done debating you, this one is the plane that will be taking us to Vancouver, a 787-9 that has yet to be repainted, so it still features the older toothpaste livery as opposed to the newer raccoon livery. And here I have some footage of a Dreamliner in their raccoon livery, which I personally prefer, but I know that's not the consensus out there, so I encourage you to have an argument over it in the comments section, as that promotes what the internet calls audience engagement. Anyways, soon it was time to board, which was done through 5 zones, with premium economy passengers situated in zone 2. And yes, they did take a huge chunk off of our boarding passes. They took the whole thing! So if you'd like to keep the whole thing as a souvenir, I suggest that you ask them to print you an extra one. Embarkation was conducted through one bridge which led to the L2 door, and after having been directed to turn right by the cabin crew, we soon found our seats. Now these aren't the newest premium economy products out there, noticeably lacking a leg rest, but otherwise there was ample width, recline, and leg room. My seat for this flight was 13D, and it was pretty standard with everything laid out where you would expect it to be. I am 181 centimeters tall, or for units that Americans would understand, about 0.00112468 miles, and I had tons of leg room. But there was this bracket down here which did sometimes get in the way. Thankfully, there was a footrest, but unfortunately, it wasn't adjustable, so you can't raise it to any other height, and it's kind of hard to retract as well. At the bottom of the seat back in front of you is a large netted magazine rack, in which you will find your standard array of literature. Above that is an old school IFE remote, which I guess we'll have a look at later. Next to the screen is a coat hook, and under the screen, I don't know if you can see this or not, are a headphone jack and a type A USB charging port. And moving on, between the seats is where you will find a pair of universal power outlets. Mind you, while the port side has two, the starboard side only has one, so that there's one per seat. Between the seats, the armrest is where you will find stowage for a tray table, as well as a small surface for drinks or something else. Below this is where you will find a cutout. I think this is where an ashtray was meant to go, but for obvious reasons, it wasn't installed. The armrest on the aisle side was a little bit more interesting, for you see, when you open it up, there's- Ha! It's uh, just a metal bracket. I wouldn't put anything in here, I'm pretty sure it's gonna fall through the holes. I think this is where a tray table is meant to be, but obviously it's not here. And finally, above you, each seat has an individual dome light and air vent, but in the middle seats, it was a little out of reach while sitting down. On the Dreamliner, the cabin's laid out in a 232 configuration, with three rows totaling 21 seats. On all variants of the 777, this becomes 3 rows of 242 and 24 seats. And on the 777-300ER layout with two business class cabins, row 14 is missing a window. It's not entirely relevant, I just thought I'd let you know anyways. And on 777-300ERs with one business class cabin, the premium economy seats are of a older variant. They're slightly thicker and harder to sit in, but otherwise provide the same width and legroom. The IFE is also an older version with a lower quality screen resolution and smaller screen size. Air Canada's website says that the seats on the 777s are half an inch wider than those found on the 787s, but personally, I've never noticed a difference. If you're seated in the front row, the IFE remote is in the armrest, as are the headphone ports. There's also an extra button used to extend the IFE screen, which comes out on an arm like this. It's slightly tilted at an angle, which is slightly tilting. The universal power outlets are also found underneath the front of the seat. Legroom in the front row is adequate, but unless you're a corgi, don't expect to be able to straighten your legs or anything. Upon boarding, each seat's IFE screen displays its associated seat number and a slideshow of photos of the destination. After boarding, a welcome drink was handed out with choices of water, orange juice, or sparkling wine. A menu was also handed out, going over the choices for dinner and what you can expect for breakfast. It was printed on this cardstock in English, French, and simplified Chinese on the back. These earphones were also distributed, they were of a in-ear variety and probably serves better as a strangulation device as opposed to one that plays audio. 
And finally, I also received this amenity kit. It's the same one as you would find in AC's North American Business Class, and here are the contents. You get a pair of socks, some eye shades, a pair of earplugs, and a dental kit, which in this case includes a toothbrush and a small tube of Colgate toothpaste. You also get the same kit if you're traveling on a domestic transcontinental route. Soon after, we began taxiing to the runway, but since we weren't sitting next to the window, I didn't get any takeoff footage from this flight. But don't worry, because the footage you're seeing right now was taken by me some years ago on the same type of Air Canada aircraft taking off from the same exact runway at the very same airport. 17-year-old me knew that a day would come when this piece of footage finally serves a purpose. Shortly after takeoff, we experienced a bout of light turbulence, so I spent this time trying to get my headrest into the optimal position. About half an hour later, as the chop subsided, a substantial hot towel was handed out, a harbinger of the food that was to come. With the imminent arrival of the food, let's prepare by deploying the tray table, which comes out of the center armrest like this. It then expands to give you more surface area, but overall it's not very large. It also slides out a little to give you more room, and is reasonably sturdy. Soon enough our food had arrived, and for dinner I chose the beef and mushroom with black pepper sauce, which absolutely did not disappoint. It was tender and flavorful, and the rice was made perfectly. It wasn't heavily seasoned either, and the flavors all came from the sauce, which wasn't overly sweet or tangy. The main course came with a salad, which was honestly a little bit mushy, and this hazelnut mille foyi, which tasted as good as its name is unpronounceable. For drinks, I asked for wine, and was a little bit disappointed when there was only one choice of red, the same plastic bottle of this Grenache you would otherwise get in economy. But it really wasn't a big deal, overall the meal was fantastic and there was nothing to complain about. Meanwhile, the girlfriend opted for the roasted chicken served in the Shanghainese sweet sauce, and very soon we were two well-fed, happy campers. Meal over, I decided to check out the Is that a cow lick in my hair? Uh, whatever. Anyways, there's really nothing special here. There's usually supposed to be a face mist in these bathrooms, but instead on this flight there was only this hand cream. And apart from that, there was this nice hand soap from the same Canadian brand, Vertruvi. There was a window, and a toilet. And as a whole, the bathroom is quite spacious and remained clean throughout the flight. Alright, then let's, uh, let's get out of here now. Returning to my seat, let's have a look at the IFE system first was checking out the remote. It comes out on the tether like this and has all the obvious media controls on the front. It also doubles as a game controller on the back, but I doubt very many people are going to use it for that purpose. The screen itself articulates, so you can find a comfortable viewing angle regardless of the position of your seat or of the one in front of you. As of the posting of this video, Air Canada has recently updated their content library as well as refreshed the interface. This aircraft that we were on was one of the first to have the new system installed. I have to say I very much like this new look, there's something about the rectangles and cards that remind me of the aesthetic I myself like to use. The route map has also been updated, with a fully interactive representation of the aircraft and the world. You can navigate freely around or defer to one of the many preset perspectives. In addition, there are also very handy city maps and guides for all the major destinations Air Canada flies to. Moving on to the entertainment aspect, this system captures a wide spectrum of movies and TV shows. A fair number of newly released movies were on offer, and you would have had to fly AC as much as I do to exhaust all the good movies from their permanent collection. In my memory, there used to be an even greater selection of new releases on offer since Air Canada used to have a partnership with Cineplex, a Canadian film distributor, but that agreement appears to have ended. Nevertheless, full seasons of select HBO shows were available, and I'd highly recommend Chernobyl for anyone who has yet to watch it. This new media player is also very versatile and responsive, but it does play quite a few ads before getting to the content. You can, however, choose to skip these, which is an option you didn't have before. If for some reason the onboard IFE doesn't suit your fancy, there's always the Wi-Fi to fall back on. It operates on both Ku and Ka bands, meaning it'll connect to ground stations when possible for the fastest speeds, and satellites when the former is unavailable. On transcontinental flights, the speeds are usually fast enough to stream YouTube videos in 720p, but on transoceanic flights, perhaps don't be as optimistic. At any rate, the prices are more than reasonable, with a full flight unlimited package capping out at $22 Canadian. 
In the end, I gave up halfway through watching Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and decided my time would be better spent unconscious. The cabin lights were also dimmed for this express purpose. And as illustrated by this uh, lady who doesn't know that I'm filming her, so please don't tell her, the recline on these seats is really good. Definitely a noticeable difference from regular old economy. If there was a leg rest, then these seats would be pretty close to perfect. On this flight, I got a solid 3 hours of sleep, and definitely slept better than I would have had I been sitting in economy. When I woke up, I found another bottle of water at my seat, as well as this package of sandwiches. They tasted okay, but were a little too cold. I also received a biscuit, and both of these are things you would also get in economy. Not long after, as we were approaching Vancouver Island, breakfast was served. Since we have departed out of Shanghai, I thought I'd try the Chinese option. But truthfully, the only thing Chinese about this was the kanji, which was mediocre at best. The girlfriend made the perhaps better choice of going with the western option, scrambled eggs and chicken sausage. And although both breakfast choices were the exact same as the one served in the economy, it wasn't overall too bad. With our meals finished, we had started our descent into YVR. All in all, we were both very happy to have been able to get this extra bit of comfort on our long trip home. And with nothing left to show you from this flight, let me give you my final thoughts about this cabin product as a whole. I've flown in this cabin about a dozen times now, and the biggest thing I've noticed is that there seems to be a disparity between the premium economy offering flying within North America and flying overseas. While the seats are obviously the same, you seem to get business class service and soft products while flying domestic routes, whereas flying overseas seems to get you service more akin to economy. So, is premium economy worth the upgrade? I guess it depends on where you're going and what you want to do. If you want a little bit of extra comfort on a long flight, the seats will definitely offer that. The extra width and recline are definitely noticeable and better than what you get in economy. However, if you're in it for the priority everything and enhanced food and services, I would steer you towards a daytime continental flight. Toronto to Vancouver, for example. This is, I think, when you get the most bang out of your buck. For half the price of business class, you get a quality meal, an essentially open bar, priority boarding and everything else, and discounted lounge access. Unless you're looking for a life flat seat or lots of privacy, premium economy really gives business class a run for its money in this segment of the market. On the flip side, on international flights, don't expect premium alcoholic beverages or the same level of service as you would expect in business class, but also don't expect to pay as much. On international routes, premium economy prices are a lot closer to flex economy fares than they are to the lowest business fares. In conclusion, there's really no definitive answer for this question. It depends on the price, the route, the time, and your own travel circumstances and habits. Premium economy in Canada exists in that tiny little margin of the market between the people who would buy the cheapest budget ticket regardless of how uncomfortable the flight is and the people who would shell out for business class. There aren't that many people who want that middle ground. Because to some people, the difference between a premium economy ticket and the absolute bare bones economy ticket is not that much different than between the bare bones economy ticket and a business class ticket. So if you're going to shell out, why not go all the way? And often I see that premium economy is filled with freaking flyers who didn't get upgraded to business class but are happy enough that they don't have to suck it in the back with everyone else. So I guess that's the end of the video. If you have any questions, please do leave a comment below, I will answer them. But for now, thanks for watching and happy travels.